I think it's fair to say that the 2023 Toronto mayoral by-election is in the home stretch. Thank God. Let's start off this week with polling, as we always do. And this week, polling became kind of a story of its own, as it seems to in every election these days. Toronto's is no different. This week, we have the tale of two polls in one, Main Street. We've talked about Main Street before. Uh, and this week, they made a bit of noise because earlier in the week, the president of Main Street, Kito Maji, uh, teased that there was going to be big news coming out. And that in itself, I guess, is not that spectacular or remarkable, except that only two hours earlier, Nick Kuvalis, who's the internal pollster for Anna Bailao's campaign, also teased that big news was coming out this week. Big news that would show Anna Bailao jumping into second place. She's mostly been in third or fourth place in all the other polls. And wouldn't you know it, by the time Friday came out, Main Street's here and it shows Anna Bailao at 20%. 20%. She's never been that high. Now, in fairness to Main Street, if we want to be fair, they have been showing Anna Bailao on the up and up. But what hasn't been happening until this poll is showing Olivia Chow on a downward trend. I should point out again, none of the other polls show this. So what's the tale of two polls? On the other side, Viewpoints. Viewpoints doesn't come out every week. They haven't released a poll for a month, but they released a poll on Friday of this week showing Olivia Chow at 37%, Saunders in second, and then Bailao down around 10%. And that 10% is kind of where all the other pollsters have had her. So either Viewpoints, Liaison, and Forum have got this wrong, or something's going on with Main Street. Interestingly, on Friday, Friday was a big day for this story in particular. Uh, polling Canada, Canada Polling, one of the polling aggregators on Twitter said that they were no longer going to use Main Street in their federal polling, or maybe in any polling, because in their opinion, Main Street artificially handicaps the NDP or NDP candidates. They said that this was true in the Alberta election. They made other allegations. I will leave it for you to go and find these on your own. But interesting. Should we still be talking about Main Street polling? The only polling that's showing Anna Bailao building her level of support. I guess we'll wait and see. Second story this morning is Anna Bailao. Anna Bailao, who got a wall-to-wall, -wall, floor to ceiling, cover page story in the Toronto Star. If you look at the content of that story, it's not all that dissimilar from the piece in The Local, which is a local Toronto magazine, good name, that came out a week or two ago. Two stories, very similar content, but that's not why people were paying attention to it on this Saturday morning. I think the reason people are paying attention is because it came hot on the heels of this Main Street poll that showed uh, Anna Bailao jumping into second place, which prompts the more conspiratorial-minded uh, out there to think that the fix is in for Anna Bailao. So here's what I say to that. Anna Bailao has, as I've always said, always been the establishment candidate. The establishment wants their candidate, and why wouldn't they? They've had it for the last 10 years at least. John Tory, if you were to look up establishment guy in the dictionary or the encyclopedia, if you have an encyclopedia, go to your shelf and pull down one of the volumes of the encyclopedia and look up establishment guy and you see a picture of John Tory. You couldn't get any closer than that. So they've done pretty well the last at least 10 years, and they don't want to give that up. So, of course, they're going to be in for Anna Bailao because she's John Tory's arguably hand-picked successor, a job that Brad Bradford wanted. Well, that's another video entirely. The complete disintegration of Brad Bradford's image is something we don't have time for this morning. But yes, she is the establishment candidate because she is the best of the bunch at telling the myth of Toronto. And the establishment needs to maintain the myth of Toronto, which is that Toronto is a great city that is just in need of a little leadership. Strong, deliberate, dedicated leadership. That's all Toronto needs, right? Arguably, we've had, like, stable leadership throughout the entire John Tory term, 10 years, and the city's only gotten worse right which is not to say that toronto's a failed city but it is a broken city it's not doing great and that line that toronto is just a good city in need of new ideas or strong leadership is held by most of the other candidates with the i would say exception the consistent ex exception of josh matlow 
So she's the establishment candidate. You don't need conspiracy to get the establishment to agree on things because they have self-interest to rely on. If you put the 10 leaders of Toronto's largest cultural institutions, educational institutions, financial institutions, political institutions, and you line them all up and said, who's your pick? They would say Anna Bailao without having to talk to each other. There doesn't have to be a conspiracy for people with very similar interests who are constantly coordinating those interests to have the same idea about anything. And the Toronto's a star is an establishment paper. I got some pushback on that when I suggested that this morning, but go back and look at who they typically endorse in elections. They endorse centrist liberal candidates. They're a centrist paper. They're the centrist paper. The Globe is center-right. The Post is right-right. The Sun is should be shot into the sun. And right there in the middle, I know we like to think Atkinson principles and all that. We like to think of the star as a lefty paper. It's not. There are no lefty papers. There's no lefty anything in the mainstream media. Forget about it. There might be lefties at the paper, but that doesn't make it a lefty paper. It's owned by venture capitalists. Let's get real, folks. Come on. But it's okay. 20% isn't going to win. Let's say that that poll is right. 20% is not going to win. And unless the establishment is willing to get on the phones and try to get voters who are overwhelmingly probably going to stay home in this election to come out for Anna Bailao, a front page cover story is not going to matter that much either. Which brings us to endorsements. You've seen them flying around. Counselors endorsing counselors, MPs endorsing people, everybody's endorsing everybody. But what about me? What about your old buddy, Josh? A few weeks ago, I made a promise that by the end of May, May 26th, I think was the date, that I would pick a candidate, enthusiastically support them, and work to help them get elected. And let me tell you, I haven't done it. I haven't done it. I failed. I failed on that one big time. There's a couple of reasons for this. But the first and foremost is that it occurs to me that this is the first election that me, as a left-leaning voter, not left-leaning, I mean, if I'm left-leaning, I'm like left-leaning like smooth criminal, right? I'm leaning. A left-leaning voter. This is the first time, and as long as I can remember, where I've had more than one imperfect candidate from which to choose. Usually we only get one on the left, right? Federal elections, provincial elections, you have to, you look at your NDP candidate, you go, uh, well, what about the Greens? And then the Greens do something stupid. Uh, Communist Party for yogic flyers? I guess some voting for the NDP candidate. The last mayoral election. Well, I don't really... I'm not too crazy about this uh, Gill guy, but what choice do I have? Or Jen Keysmat before that. Right? The last time we had an even competitive election was 2014. And if you were on the left, you still didn't have any choice. You had Olivia Chow. And in this election, we have that. We have Olivia Chow and we have Josh Matlow. And I know that there are a good number of people out there who don't buy into Josh Matlow's conversion from a dedicated centrist to a center-left candidate. I do. People can change. Another reason why I've been a little hesitant to pick is because I don't particularly like the supporters of politicians in the context of a campaign. Outside of a campaign, everybody's great. No problems with them whatsoever. Have a beer. Be friendly. It's all good. But in the context of a campaign, it brings out the worst in people. And I have to say that Olivia Chow's supporters are bringing out the worst in themselves. It's a turnoff. It's a turnoff to be told as though it is an absolute truth that Olivia Chow is the one and only candidate who can blah, 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 blah. The only one who could possibly da 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 And especially, now this goes way back to the very first video I made about this election. When people will tell you that such and such a candidate is the only person who can stop the bad guy or gal from getting elected. What I'm saying is that progressive candidates need to do more than just ask us to support them because they're progressive. Guys, the bad guy and gal almost always gets elected. And that that line gets trotted out again this one time when a progressive candidate is in the lead. And we don't use this as our one opportunity for a little bit of olive branching, if you will, for a little bridge building. Instead, we're going to draw those same lines in the sand that say, my candidate is the only one who can X, Y, Z. I'm sorry, that's a big turnoff. It's a big, big turnoff. It's arrogant. It's foolish. I don't buy into it. 
generally speaking, Olivia Chow seems like a kind of a perfect candidate for me. A hard left candidate who's actually got a solid chance of winning? Why not? But then there's Josh Matlow. Josh Matlow, an imperfect candidate, just as Olivia Chow is an imperfect candidate. They're all imperfect candidates. But it sure is nice to have more than one imperfect candidate from which to choose. Josh Matlow, a guy who's got ideas, a guy who is willing to say that not only is this city facing huge challenges, but that it is structurally dysfunctional. And that structural dysfunction runs all the way through the city, including its bureaucracy. I don't think there's another candidate in this race who will, if they are elected mayor, take on the city's bureaucracy. I don't think I have no reason to believe Olivia Chow will do it. I think Olivia Chow will play a very middle-of-the-road game going in there, talking about the nobility of public service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think she'll take them on head-to-head. Head head. And I really, truly believe that's what this city needs, that this city desperately needs someone who will take on the structural failures within the city of Toronto head-on. And so that's why... I am supporting Josh Matlow for mayor of Toronto. And going forward, I'm going to do what I can to encourage others to also support his candidacy. And when we get to election day, I'm going to make a choice that's going to be the right choice for Toronto. And the wrong choice for Toronto is Mark Saunders, Anna Bailao, Brad Bradford, Anthony Fury. Those are all the wrong choice for Toronto. I'm going to make the right choice for Toronto. But today, a couple weeks late, I'm endorsing Josh Matlow. I encourage you to do the same. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Hey, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. I've been so appreciative of the people who've subscribed over the course of this election. I would love it if you were one of those people. Come on aboard. Join the stupidity. I want to hear from you. Comment below. Like. Do all that stuff. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.